the first verse of Revelation chapter 4. God says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. We're looking at verse 1 of Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. Now we're going to look at this only briefly, this particular verse. We are going to talk about other passages that this verse is talking about, but it's not as exhaustive as what we are going to get in other passages. But just to get some context here, that this is Revelation chapter 4. The book of Revelation in chapter 1, verse next to the last chapter, two pages previous, you can see the outline of the book in verse 19. God's outline of the book of Revelation is in verse 19. He says, write Okay, and these are the writings. Write the things which ha thou hast seen, that would be past, the things which are, that would be present, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, the verse, chapter 4, verse 1, begins the third part of that outline. The things that shall be hereafter. Verse, chapter 1 is the things which thou hast seen. He had already saw those things, and he had already seen those things, and he wrote them down there. And then the things which are continue for two chapters, and that is the seven, verse, or the seven churches uh, in, of Asia Minor that's written, written about in the book of Revelation. And those things were in existence at his writing, and his inspiration at his is appearing at this time to John. And as, so as we read those things, since they are seven churches which are, they are actually in one respect directly related to us. Why is that? Because we are a church. We are in the church age. And so there were seven churches and they all had different uh, characteristics and different promises and different warnings and we can look at those and see what kind of church we might be and where our problems might be where our commendation might be and our condemnation might be but also since we are part of the church each one of us as individuals are part of the church we find that these seven descriptions describe seven Christian individuals, seven, seven kinds of Christians. Now, these things, and, and then some also teach that there are seven church ages or uh, divisions of seven ch divisions of church history. Now, that is a little bit debatable, maybe, but almost all the commentaries will agree with that. But I, I just don't see it as much as they do. I didn't, don't study history probably as much as they do. Uh, my son Joshua, he he's really loves church history and I love to listen to him talk about it. <laughs> and uh, I do like church history also. If you read my devotions you find I refer to church history quite a bit. And uh, so, but then the last part is the things which are, shall be hereafter. Now look, look what he says there in chapter 1 verse 19. He says, the right to things which thou hast sing, and the things which are, and the things that, now listen to this, shall be hereafter. And then he says in chapter 4 verse 1, after this. So he's talking about the hereafter. And he, behold, a door is open in heaven. And there are certain things I want us to pay attention to here. Behold, a door was open in heaven. 
and the first voice. Okay, so there's a door in heaven and he is taken up to heaven and we'll learn more about that if the Lord allows maybe next week. But the, the voice spoke to him and listen to what it says about the voice, which I heard was as it were a trumpet. So it's the voice that sounds like a trumpet. It's as if it were a trumpet, which said, come up hither. And we find this written some other place also. But this, we believe, what happened to John. And, and, I, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. So after the church age, he's going to write from there to halfway through the last chapter of Revelation about what would happen after the church age. So it's all prophecy from here to chapter 22. In chapter 22, again, it goes back. And what, what has happened here? John was, went to the transporter, you know, and he was, instead of being transported down to earth or, or whatever, he was transported through time. And this happened to him spiritually. And you can read about the next verse. He was transported and he was carried to the time when God says come up hither and he would shoot the things which be hereafter that we will be taken up John was raptured at that point John was taken up and over in John the last chapter John the last chapter Peter was there God, Jesus was talking to Peter and he says uh, you know follow follow me follow thou me he says Peter you love me he said I, I, you know all things I like you pretty well and, uh, and he says, well, follow thou me. But Peter, do you love me? And he says, well, I, I like you very much. And Jesus says, well, follow me and feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And he finally asked the third time, well, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you know all things. You know I like you. And he says, well, follow me anyway. If you don't love me, follow me anyway. That's what love is. It's obeying. You know, so if you follow me, you're, you're obeying and you're loving me. And then he turned around. <laughs> follow me. Jesus starts walking and Peter goes, <laughs> you know, he turns around the other way. And he says, Master, what shall this man do? And he was speaking of John. And he said, I, Jesus said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. And John did. He didn't die until he had, was raptured and he went to heaven. He looked back down on earth. He saw the things that were happening on earth. The new Jerusalem came out of the heavens and down to the earth. And, and, and he saw all of that. And then the most disappointing part of the, the book, probably, for him, was when he was transported back in time, back to the Isle of Patmos, and he eventually died on earth. So he, he's, just so you know, he, he's dead now, right? But he did tarry to the Lord's coming. He fulfilled that passage. There's another place also that refers to the, that. So... This is what he's talking about here. He was raptured. And so we are looking at that, what is going to happen to us. The trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. It's interesting also that it says this same thing in the middle of the tribulation, halfway to the end of the book. He says again, Come up, come up hither, and a trumpet sounds in the middle of the tribulation and so is there a partial rapture in the middle of the tribulation that's kind of interesting you might look into that so let's see I want to see what it talks about the rapture first of all let's look over first Corinthians chapter 15 what we can learn about the rapture of the church the rapture of the church you're not going to find the word in English because it comes from rapios which is uh, Latin and the New Testament was written in English for us, but it came from the Greek. 
It was written originally in Greek. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you've got your old Schofield on page 1227, we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Now he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, and of course we're talking to believers there, not to everybody, but to believers, but uh, they're subject to the same thing as we are as far as what he's talking about in this verse. This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What in the world is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is referring primarily to Jesus ruling on the earth in the millennial reign. But the kingdom of God really is eternity and everything in it. God doesn't just rule for a thousand years on the earth. He rules all of the universe and beyond. You know, as, as Harry Lightyear says, what's his name? Buzz Lightyear. He says, to infinity and beyond. He rules to infinity and beyond. And, and so, he's, that's, that's his kingdom. So that would be before all time, after all time. And so he rules everything. That's his kingdom. That's God's kingdom. So we cannot inherit that. Why not? We want to. We want to go to heaven and have our eternal life and, and exist with God forever. Why can't we inherit that? Because we're not born in that kind of family. We were born in a family that, that our parents die eventually, and therefore we are going to follow suit. We inherited that characteristic. In, inherit. Uh, like inheriting, you know, and, and inherited some traits from my dad, and some shortcomings actually from my dad that he can't, couldn't do, he did, and, and I can't do them either. He can't. Um, live underwater without some way of breathing and he can't fly through the air without some kind of machine or help there either. Uh, there was only one time that I ever flew through the air without help of, of mechanical help and that was in ninth grade. Huh? When you get flown. <laughs> exactly. A guy hit me in the nose, broke my nose and knocked me ten feet through the air and uh, so I, I had my eyes closed, my hands behind my back and I uh, went an idiot. Uh, me. I mean, who would do that? But so, I, I, but I can't fly for, for any distance, <laughs> and my dad because my dad couldn't, and that would be something I inherited a shortcoming, and well, that is in my flesh. We cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, how do we can we inherit the kingdom of God? Is if we would would be born into God's family, see. That's the reason it's so important to be born again. Because our first birth isn't good enough. I don't care if it never sinned. It just doesn't have the capacity to live forever. And we can see that in the verses to follow here. Let's see what it's talking about. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit. Remember, how do you get something, inherit something? Somebody's got to die. But if we're not wanting to die and be like him. Uh, well, Jesus died, but he came back from the dead, see? And so, if we are in Jesus, if we were born of Jesus, then we can inherit his riches, his kingdom, actually, what he's talking about, his kingdom. So, we can inherit, also, there has to be a will, a last will and testament, as it's called in, in Hebrews chapter 9. And, and so the, the will is not enforced until the person dies. And uh, I, some years ago, my, my grandmother died. And, well, her will was everything would go to my dad. That makes sense, right? And, uh, and then his will was everything would be divided with his, between his two sons. Yeah, both of them. Both things that he had left when he died. Um, and, and so, well, he angered, not my son, but he angered, there was a particular thing that they had left to somebody else. And he angered my dad. So my dad changed his will. You see? So what is the will of God? The will of God, I, in John chapter 6, verse 40, God says, 
And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So if you see the Son, that means to understand who he is, what he did. If you understand who Jesus is, what he did, what, what he's God who took on flesh, what did he do? He died and he paid for our sins. So if we understand that, and then what do we have to do? Believe it. <laughs> he that sees the Son and believes on it, then you're in His will. You're in His last will and testament. He's already died. You see, He died 2,000 years ago, so we don't have to worry about Him changing the will. He's not one according to the Old Testament. He's not as a man that will change His mind about those things, about His promises. So, we can inherit the kingdom. Uh, needs to be something to inherit, though, right? If you don't have anything, it's nothing to inherit. Well, what does God have? Everything. <laughs> you know, so in Him, we can inherit all things. So, so that's a pretty good thing. So we, we get this by inheritance, not by works or goodness or becoming a Christian or by joining the church or anything. It's by inheritance, by being born in God. How do you born in God's family? How can you be born in God's family? Uh, Nicodemus asked Jesus that. He said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And uh, Jesus said, well, there's, you know, there's birth, physical birth and the spiritual birth. That which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. And Nicodemus says, how can this be? How can I be born again? So Jesus answered him with these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So to be born again, that's what you have to do. He was answering Nicodemus's question. How can a man be born when he is old? How can these things be? And so what do we need to do? We need to understand that God did the work, God did the loving, and we do the believing. That's all just like the will in John 6.40. And that whosoever believeth in him, should, then the two results, shall not perish. You don't have to worry about your future. You won't perish. But have everlasting life. Don't have to worry about the present. Right now, you have everlasting life. All right. Now, that's how we inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth, ah, uh, here, why, why do we need to be born again? Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. You see, this flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It can't. Why? Because it is corruptible. It is going to age. You probably already experienced that a time or two. <laughs> You're going to, we're going to age. We're going to die. Uh, I don't think any of you have experienced that. We're going to age. We're going to die. And then we're going to rot. You see? That's corruption. And because of that, we can't inherit anything that's eternal because what our flesh and blood is going to age die and rot and well not maybe not the soul but the, your flesh and blood will and, and so that's why we need to inherit the kingdom of God behold I show you a mystery now what is a mystery I'm in verse 51 now what is a mystery uh, we've studied about this on Sunday night. You know, a mystery is a revealed truth. Or maybe we could put it this way. It is a truth revealed at the proper time. Or a truth revealed for the first time. In other words, in the Old Testament, they didn't know, know all the stuff that we know now because we got it all written down right here. And, uh, but, but, so they, there were certain things they didn't know. They were mysteries to them. What's one mystery? It's the church. We know the church because we are the church. We are in the church. Okay, so the mystery, that, that was revealed in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 3. Not just there, but in Ephesians chapter So the church was revealed. Other things were revealed in the New Testament. The church age was revealed in the New Testament. So they were mysteries in the Old Testament, but now they're mysteries because they have been revealed. That's what it means, a mystery. So he's going to show us a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed. Now that's interesting the way that's worded and it's important we understand that. It's talking about we shall not all sleep. How, what, what I've heard preachers say this, you know, some are going to sleep in the dust of the earth and, and, and some will be alive at the rapture of the church and they will be changed. That's not what it says. It says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So, in other words, some will sleep and some will be changed. No, some will sleep, but all will be changed. So everybody's going to be raptured at the same time, same way. Uh, just so you understand what sleep is in the Bible, sleep is not well, similar to death, but actually there's a difference. We shall not all sleep, but are all going to die. <laughs> okay, as opponent in man wants to die. So what's the difference? Sleep is the period of time between your death and your resurrection. If there's no period of time between the death and resurrection, there's no sleep. Now your soul does not sleep. Your body sleeps in the dust of the earth. And so we go to heaven and we are in absent, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We are immediately in heaven with the Lord at the moment we die. And if we happen to take our body with us because we're being raptured, there's no sleep for us. See? And that's the difference. We shall not all sleep. Those who are alive at the rapture will not sleep, but we're all going to be changed. Now, I, I talked to one guy and he said, that, by the way, point being of that statement there is there is no soul sleep. Your body sleeps, but not your soul. The teaching of soul sleep is cultic heresy. It is the heresy the cults hold on to. And they believe that when you die, you sleep into the resurrection. And that's not scriptural. Here he says that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, when will this take place? I talked to one fellow one time, and he said, well, you know, when you die, you're immediately... Uh, you immediately receive your glorified body and you are judged then, you receive your rewards right then. And uh, that everybody has got their own resurrection and their own um, rewards and time of their own judgment, time of judgment and rewards. We'll talk about judgment next week if the Lord allow. But what, he, what he's saying here, he tells us, we shall be changed in a moment. That's one moment. In a moment, not, not. I mean, that's just what it is, and take my word for it. And we'll find out more about that in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, that's how quick it's going to be. You know, we we like to f pretend that we're taken up at the rapture. You know, and we're kind of floating up, and we're looking back, and and uh, the clouds, they're just, uh, caught up in the clouds. You know, the clouds, and you all know this. You just may not have thought about it, but the clouds are really close to the earth. There, you get up 40,000 feet in an airplane, you don't see any more clouds. <laughs> clouds are way down there. If you're up 15,000 feet, you don't generally go through clouds then either. They're not usually that hot, but that when we are caught up in the clouds, he's not talking about in the clouds of moisture. We'll talk about that in a moment if the Lord allows. All right, so that he over here in First Corinthians says, in the twinkling of an eye will be like that. It won't be where you float up slowly and you're able to look around and talk to each other and stuff like that. It's in a moment. One moment. In the twinkling, twinkling of an eye. Hmm? <laughs> we will do that, I think, maybe. But not on the way up. Because we wouldn't have much time for that. You see? So, um, for when? When is it going to take place? At the last trump. Okay, there's not a last trump for me, and a last trump for Harry, and a last trump for Don, and a last trump. There's one last trump. And we're all, therefore, going to be taken up at the last trump. Even the sleeping ones are going to go at the last trump also. And we go on, and he says, and the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ, those who have been, uh, been sleeping, shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
Okay, so there we're, and he includes himself as far as being raised and changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this incorruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Two reasons why we need this resurrection. If we want to exist with God in eternity, there are two reasons why we need an a resurrection, actually no more than that, but we're just looking at two in this passage, and that is corruption and mortality. Now they're almost the same thing. Just like death and sleep is almost the same thing, but it's not. You know, it, it's, it isn't. Okay, so uh, there's mortality and corruption. Corruption is where you age, die, and run. Mortality is you die. And so our body is mortal. Only the superheroes are, are immortal. You know, <laughs> they, they can't die. Some of them can't, apparently. Uh, they change, but can't die. But uh, that we are going to die. That is the nature of our body, our blood, flesh and blood. And that's why we need a new body, one that is immortal. Also, our body is corruptible. It's going to age, get sick, die, and rot. And so we, we don't want to do that in heaven. And we we're not, won't be able to do that in heaven because we've got to go through that death. And so we need to have an incorruptible body. And that's what he's saying in verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Let's look over about this stuff over in Jude, verse 24. Uh, see why this is important. In Jude, another reason. I just love this verse. I, let me just share it with you, okay? It doesn't have to do with anything. But in, in Jude, chapter 25... Everybody there at Jude chapter 25? Well, look at verse 25 then. It's only one chapter in Jude. So. <clears throat> Jude verse 25, God says, or 24 is what I'm wanting to look at. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory, which with exceeding glory, with exceeding joy. Now, what is he saying here? He, he is able to keep you from falling. In other words, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. Now, that's what, what's neat about that is we've talked about how that his glory, no sin can in, exist in the presence of his glory. So if we went into the presence of his glory with any sin, uh, then we would be consumed by the brightness of his glory. But he is able to do that. He's able to pr present us faultless before the presence of his glory with great joy. He, he's loving this. And, and so how does, what, what, what did he need to do? Well, he took away our sinful body, our mortal body, our corruptible body, and gives us a glorified body so that we can come into the presence of God without uh, worry about being consumed by his holy, righteous, glorious presence. And so he is able, but one thing I want to point out about that verse there. Uh, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Some have said that that word should be stumbling. In fact, I think even in the old Schofield note there, under number R, he says stumbling. Uh, well, that is a possible translation of that word. He's not being dishonest, but I think he's missing the point, <laughs> you know, because bottom line, in this life, we stumble around a lot, you know, uh, and we, uh, but he's able to keep us from falling. If he's able to keep us from stumbling, why not me? See, uh, and, but we stumble. And so he's not keeping us from stumbling. He's keeping us, when we stumble, we don't fall. What do we mean? You know, fall out of, uh, of salvation or whatever. And so that is a better word. It is, the other is a, a, a true translation, a remote translation of the same word. But the main or the suitable translation for this is falling. He doesn't allow you to fall when we come into his presence. Also, 
He is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. What do we think of faultless being? Righteous, perfect, right? We're faultless. That's, that's what we, we visualize there. But some have said, I have translated this, present you blameless. Now, that is a different thing altogether. Blameless is when you sin, you do the right thing to make it, to make it right. In other words, in the Old Testament, they would offer sacrifices. In the New Testament, you confess your sin. But is he saying for you to come into his presence, you have to com confess your sin? You have to be blameless? That's, yeah, we're not blameless. So that's, that's scary. We are faultless. So faultless is the better translation. Now both are actually accurate translations, just different meanings to the same word. Like we use the expression of a, a palm, you know, palm can be the tree out front or the palm of your hand or what you do to the ball, basketball when you carry it. And they're completely different things, not even related. And faultless and blameless are not the same thing. Faultless is the, the better, what is it that determines the translation of the word? In Greek we're told three things and English too. There's the, the word, the root word, what the root ma meaning is. There is the ending which changes, if it's a verb, and, and well it's a noun also in, in Greek. And, but the main, the number one thing that determines the meaning of a word is the context. And the context here is we're not going to fall. We're going to come into his presence of his glory. So there can't be any sin. And we will come in there. So we're, he's able to keep us from falling. Keep us from stumbling. Doesn't fit. He's able to present us faultless. To present us blameless doesn't fit. Because we as believers can be blamed until we lose our, glory, our, our physical bodies, our mortal bodies, our incor our, or our corruptible bodies. So, the reason we need to have those things, he spoke about those kind of bodies, is because we will come into his glorious presence. Let's look over at 1 Thessalonians. This is the definitive rapture passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's it's the last passage we're going to look at. We might look at a verse or two, but we might not. Verse or two in another place. First Thessalonians, and let's start in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Okay, so he doesn't want an ignorant brethren. Right? He wants us to understand some things here. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning brethren, he's talking to believers, of course. Concerning them which are asleep. Those believers who have died and their soul is sleeping. No, the soul is out from, from the body and present with the Lord. But their body has been put in the dust of the earth and their, their body is sleeping until it is resurrected. That's what he's talking about here. Concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope for. All right, here's the condition. For this to be true, us, here's the condition. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So if we, what do we need to do? We need to believe. Remember, that's the only condition we've seen so far is to believe. And what do we need to believe? That Jesus died. He paid for our sins and that he was resurrected. He finished the job. And so he is going to be the king. And so, so if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, those who have gone on, the sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? So it's not saying he's going to raise them from the dead, is it? Well, it's not saying it in that verse. <laughs> it will in the next couple of verses. But he's talking about that he's going to, the soul and spirit is with the Lord, and therefore he's going to bring the soul and spirit with him. When he comes to the second coming, at Matthew, he, he says this kind of interesting, the way it's interpreted sometimes. In Matthew chapter 24, God says, 
in verse 27. He says, For as lightning comes out of the east and shineth even to the west. Now he's not talking about the rapture here, although some have mistaken this for rapture. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. You can read about that in Revelation 19. They call it the Supper of the Great God. The vultures will eat the flesh of kings and captains, etc. Immediately, now, when is he talking about here? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, at the end of the tribulation, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, from the four winds of heaven to the other. This is not talking about the rapture of the church. Even though there's a trumpet there, it's not talking about the wine. Because where is he gathering his elect from? Heaven. Four winds of heaven. So they're already in heaven at this point. And, uh, so, and that's kind of what we're talking about over here. He's going to bring... He's going to bring the dead in Christ with him. And the Lord shall, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, just, we read about that in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and with the trump of God, so if you want to know who I'm voting for, it's the trump of God. Okay. Uh, if there is one. <laughs> <laughs> with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They, we're going to bring he's going to bring the dead in Christ with him, right? Know what it says? But now it says they're going to rise first. What, which, is he, which is it? Are they going to rise or is he going to bring them? I mean here a couple of verses away. It sounds like a contradiction doesn't it? Well the soul and spirit come with him because they were absent from the body and present with the Lord. But the bodies were in the dust of the earth, sleeping in the dust of the earth. So the bodies after, so they're, they're up there without a body right now. And so they're looking forward to this. You know, it's kind of like the guy that was floating down the river just ahead, just ahead floating, you've heard it, just ahead floating down the river and it's singing at the top of his I'd say his lungs, but he didn't have any lungs. Uh, so he's, he's just singing at this head, and he's singing, I ain't got no body. Uh, thank you, I appreciate I appreciate that, Beth. She's heard it before. But uh, at any rate, so we see here that, that they are without a body and they're coming, their soul and spirit's coming with the Lord and th then their body rises to meet their soul and the spirit in, in the clouds, you see. And then it says, but the dead in Christ shall rise first. And this has confused some people. Uh, one fellow used to say, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why? Why did the dead in Christ rise first? And he used to answer, uh, because they have six feet further to go. Well, that's not what it really is talking about. They will rise, be, not before us. They will rise before we are to gather. Just as we are going to rise and receive our glorified body in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, they will receive their glorified body before we are united. That way we can see them, we can hug them, we can kiss them, you see, if they are our relative. Okay? Uh, so, but that is, the, the rising first is not talking about an order of resurrection there. It's talking about before that we are together in the clouds, there will be a resurrection both of the sleeping and the living. And we'll receive our new glorified body together. We all, according to 1 Corinthians 15, we all shall be changed. For Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from, with, from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them 
we will caught up, be caught up to gather. They didn't get a six foot uh, head start. We're going to be caught up to gather with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And this should be great comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another at these words. The reason we aren't comforted at funerals you know, we talked about that there are two basic reactions people have to funerals. Is they either get mad at God or they ha receive great comfort. Those that get mad at God get mad at God because they're not, they're choosing not to believe God's promise. You see? But if they know God's promises and they believe God's promises, they know it's just going to be a little while before we're reunited. And they're not going to be in pain and neither are we. See, we're going to receive our glorified bodies at the same time. Now, let's see how this applies to us. I just want you to see this real quickly in the last few verses here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, now we're in chapter 5 now, verse 1, he says, But of the times and the seasons of the rapture, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh in the thief in the night. For when they shall say, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Rapture? We don't have to be in darkness, that that day would overtake us as a thief. You're of the children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Now he's talking about the spiritual sleep. In Romans, where he says to the Roman believers, Awake thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and God shall give thee life, or light. So he's talking about, it's, let's not pretend that we're, you know, act like a sleeping brother before we die. For they that sleep in the, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Let us, therefore, who are of the day, be sober, putting on breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So we know, we can know, and there are many evidences and promises that we can know that His coming is soon.